Father, as we have already sung this morning, we do desire to worship the Lamb of Glory. In that worship, we need to hear, we need to understand, and we need to be moved to walk in obedience. For the essence of worship is obedience. So I, we pray that as we spend time here learning about our Lord and Savior's second coming, that there might be principles, that there might be provoking that comes to our hearts and comes to our minds that we might worship more fully the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's in His name we pray and we ask. Amen. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. We are in chapter 17 this morning and we've come to the end of uh, what has been a three-part series where Jesus is informing the, his disciples about future things. And the heart of this particular passage is zeroed in on the time of his second coming. The disciples, you remember, believed what the prophets wrote, as did most Jews of that day, believed what the prophets wrote, that when the promised Messiah came, he would establish his kingdom upon the earth. And so as they became aware that Jesus was the Messiah, they were looking for the kingdom. That was the testimony of the Old Testament. That was the theology of the conservative Jew. That was the expectation of the nation in Jesus' day. And that was the anticipation of his disciples that Jesus, the Messiah of God, was the king who would come and establish the kingdom of God on earth. He would be a descendant of David who would sit on David's throne, lifting the nation of Israel to a place of prominence above all the other nations of the world to serve them on the king's behalf. And it would be a time of blessing, it would be a time of peace, it would be a time of joy, it would be a time of prosperity, a time of righteousness. It would be the time of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants, as well as the many prophecies given through the prophets regarding that time of the kingdom. But at this point in the Gospel of Luke, you recall that the disciples are still blind to many of the aspects of the end times. First, they were blind to their personal need for a final atonement for sin, for themselves or anyone else to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom would first have to be an inner reality, God ruling on the inner part of man over the heart of man before it became an external reality. Second, they were blind to God's plan that through the Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection, that very atonement for sin would come about. Third, they were blind to the fact that it would be that generation of Israel who would reject and who would crucify the Messiah. Fourth, they were blind to the fact that he would ascend to heaven after his resurrection. Fifth, they were blind to the fact that God's judgment would fall on that particular generation of Israel in 70 AD for the rejection of their Messiah, ending the priesthood, ending the sacrificial system, ending temple worship. Six, they were blind to the fact that they, there would be an unspecified time before he would return a second time to establish his kingdom on earth, a time where Jew and Gentile together would be Christ's body in the world. Seventh, they were blind to the fact that when he returned, the prelude to his coming would be a time of worldwide judgment, a time of cleansing the, the earth, the whole earth, of those who refused his atoning sacrifice for sin and refused to have him as their merciful, benevolent, and righteous king who would rule over them. So at this point in the gospel, the disciples still had an awful lot to learn. 
They had a lot to learn about the role of the Messiah. They had a lot to learn about the timing of the coming of the kingdom. But little by little, they would learn. Jesus will teach them more about the future coming of the kingdom before he goes to the cross. It would become a bit more clear after his resurrection. It would be even more clear after his ascension. Clearer still after they see the Gentiles receive the promise of the new covenant. Even clearer when Paul receives revelation regarding the believers meeting of the Lord in the air. And even more clear when John receives the final revelation on the Isle of Patmos in 90 AD, 20 years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we, can, we can understand much more about the Messiah's first and second coming than the disciples did here at this time in Luke 17, because we have a completed canon to study from. We are this side of the cross and resurrection. We are this side of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. We are this side of God's revelation to us regarding the rapture, the judgment, the kingdom, and the eternal state. But at this point in the gospel, Jesus is moving his disciples in that direction. He's giving them what they need for that time, for where they are at this point. In fact, if you survey all that the gospels record concerning what Jesus taught his disciples on these future things, you could really boil it down into two simple main categories. He taught concerning the near future for their generation, and he also taught concerning the far future, specifically his second coming, or the day of his second coming. His teaching concerning the near future was focused on the persecution that his immediate followers that he would, was talking to would suffer as well as the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and his teaching concerning the far future zeroed in on the day of his second coming when he would return in glory visible and physically in order to establish his earthly kingdom. It would be a time of salvation for God's people and it would be a time of judgment for unbelievers. So in the gospel accounts, Jesus, for the most part, doesn't reveal other things that we commonly associate with the second coming, or at least when we think about the second coming. He doesn't focus on the rapture. He doesn't focus on the building of another temple after the destruction of that one in 70 AD. He doesn't focus on the tribulation period, the Antichrist, the millennium, or the restoration of the Jewish nations. Those things were revealed to the apostles after his ascension. It was revelation that was to be delivered to the church mainly through that which was given to Paul and that which was given to John. And so we find Jesus teaching on future things in the gospel when we, when we look at the things that he taught, it tends to be either focused on the near future for that generation or on the far future concerning that day of his second coming. And that's what we find here in verses 22 through 37. He's not giving the disciples a chrono chronological layout of all that was going to be happening in the end times, but he's telling them about the general characteristic of future things to come. Let me just quickly review. We've already looked at four characteristics. Let me review those four with you first, and then we'll finish up looking at the last two. Remember, Jesus began by telling them that believers will be longing for the days of his kingdom. Look at verse 22. He says, And he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Now, that's something that would certainly be true for all believers. We all long for the time of the Son of Man's righteous rule upon the earth. But that was certainly and uniquely a, a, a um, reality, a part of their experience. They were persecuted, they were jailed, they were martyred for the proclamation of the gospel. They had to endure all the horrific blasphemy about their Lord, their Christ, 
and they long to see one of the days of his return, the days of his kingdom, the days, it says, of the Son of Man, and yet they didn't. They didn't. That was true of them, and it's been true of every generation since, really. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, we know, will be persecuted. All who identify with Jesus will, to some degree, be persecuted. We will have to endure the unrighteousness of the unbeliever and the blasphemies concerning our Lord that come as we minister to the world around us. So that is a general characteristic of the days before his coming, whether a believer is near to that coming or far from it. Next, we said that his second coming would be witnessed by the world. Look at verse 23. They will say to you, look there, look here. Do not go away and do not run after them. For just like the lightning, when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Jesus is telling them here that while the believer is longing for that day of his coming, that there will be many deceivers trying to lead people astray. But because his second coming is going to be a worldwide spectacle, there's no reason to fall for those deceptions. So believers will be longing for his coming first, second, his second coming will be witnessed by the world, and third, his coming is going to be delayed. That was the third characteristic that he gives them here. The coming of the Son of Man was going to be delayed, and so the coming of his earthly kingdom was going to be delayed. The reason for that he gives us in verse 25. Jesus says, He first must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He was telling the disciples that before his glory comes, there's going to have to be suffering. There was a work that Jesus had to accomplish in order to redeem sinners, in order to atone for their sin, in order to to justify the ungodly before God so we could enter the kingdom of God. And that work demanded that he suffer many things on our behalf as our substitute, as our representative before God to make us right with God so we can be citizens of his kingdom. He had to redeem a people to himself for his kingdom And he did that through the shedding of his own blood. He did that through his sinless life he lived on our behalf. He did that through his death and resurrection. And fourth, we saw that his second coming would begin with the sudden destruction of the wicked. Look at verse 26. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying... They were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planning, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So just like the days of Noah... Just like the days of Lot, life was carrying on as usual, but life as usual was full of wickedness. Although God's righteousness was being preached, remember nobody was listening. Then one day Noah enters the ark. One day Lot leaves Sodom and suddenly God's judgment falls and destroys them all. Jesus says in verse 30 there, it will be just the same. Just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So the prelude to his kingdom will be one of cataclysmic judgment. Now there are still two characteristics of that day that we want to look at this morning. And again, they revolve around that far future day of his second coming. The first we find in verse 31, and it tells us that his second coming will be a day when hearts are revealed. When hearts are revealed. This is really a warning to make sure that your heart isn't tied to the things of the world. This is a warning against loving the world more than loving God. This is a warning that when Christ comes, the heart that loves him will be revealed as will the heart that doesn't 
love him. Look at verse 31 with me. On that day, he says, what day? Well, in our context, on the day that the Son of Man is revealed, on that day of his physical, visible return, on that day of judgment, on that day, he says, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. That's the warning. When the day of his return comes, those who are alive on the earth on that day of his judgment, the one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house, that one must not go down to take them out. Now, for most of us, the first question is, what in the world are they doing on the housetop? I mean, are they repairing the shingles? Are they fixing the gutters? What are they doing on the housetop? It doesn't make a lot of sense to us in this culture. But if you are familiar with the Mediterranean area or have seen pictures of uh, most of that Middle Eastern architecture, you know that the roofs on the houses are typically flat. They were patios. In fact, they were really the grand room for the house. Typically, they had um, exterior staircases that would run up the outside of the house to get to those. It was a, a wonderful place of, of used for all kinds of things. But in order to come down from the roof, you didn't have to go into the house. You could just leave those exterior stairs. That housetop was used for everything from lounging to eating to drying clothes, drying fruit and vegetables in their seasons. They often had ovens up there to keep the heat out of the houses. They would often sleep up there on hot nights. So the housetop was used daily. It, 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 was a, it was a very useful room in the house. Now the exhortation is that when the Lord returns, and remember everyone will know that moment of his return, when the Lord returns, Jesus is saying that on that day, the one on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down to take them out. You'll know Jesus has come. You'll know it's time for the kingdom. You'll know it's time for, of judgment of the wicked. And so you will need to walk away from everything. Judgment is going to fall. There's nothing you will need. There's nothing that's going to survive that judgment anyway. Walk away from it. Don't treasure your house. Don't treasure anything in your house. Don't treasure your pictures. Don't treasure your computer, your phone, your books, your clothes, your furniture, your bank uh, information. Treasure nothing in that house. He gives another illustration here as well. It's, it's some, someone who is working out in the field. And he says here, and likewise, the one who is in the field must not turn back. For the one on that day, if you're out in the field working somewhere, you're not to go back to the barn. You're not to go back to the house. You're, you're not to turn back as if you need to get anything, as if you needed to save anything. There's nothing that that is there that should be counted as more valuable than Christ. Don't go back to get anything. Leave it all. Don't go down from the housetop back into the house. Don't go from the field back to the house to get anything. So the issue here is that to leave everything in a moment, to not think twice about letting everything go, you're going to have to make sure that your heart isn't tied to the things of the world. This is describing a general attitude of the heart that you are always ready to leave everything. That your hearts are not tied to this world. That life for you isn't made up by what you have, what you possess. You say, Larry, how do you, how do you know that's what these are saying? Well, because Jesus gives an illustration to explain that it's an issue of the heart in the next verse. Look at verse 31, 32. He says, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Do you remember Lot's wife? We'll turn over to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19 and look at verse 15. 
It was the day of judgment. And it says, when morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or, look what will happen, or you will be, you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated, it says. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought him outside, one said, Escape for your life. Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh, oh no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have sworn me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. He was scared to death that he couldn't make it that far before it fell. And so he says here, Now behold, this town is near enough to flee, and, and it's small. Please let me escape there. It's, is it not small? That my life may be saved. And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town is called Zoar. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Verse 24, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. Look at verse 26. But his wife from behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Remember Lot's wife. We've been given this interesting note here that she was behind him. Maybe she wasn't that excited about leaving Sodom as Lot was. Maybe she was dragging her feet, longing for what she was leaving. She was told to escape for her life. I mean, at four times through that passage, the word escape is used. Escape. For your life, do not look back. The problem was, her life was back in Sodom. That's why she looked back. She loved, she longed for what she was leaving. She valued it more than God. Her looking back revealed where her heart really was. Let me kind of paint this picture for you. Um, you want to turn over to Genesis 13. In verse 1 it says, So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. One thing that I find really interesting, that in every mention of Abraham's nephew Lot, you never hear about his wife, do you? until he's leaving Sodom. I can't be dogmatic about this, but it appears that that is where he found his wife, in Sodom. That could have been her home. Verse 2, it says here, goes on to say, Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there formerly. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now, verse 5, Now Lot, Lot, who went with Abraham also, had flocks and herds and tents. Note the plural on all of that. He had flocks and he had herds and he had tents. 
And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together for their possessions. Both Abraham's possessions and Lot's possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. Now we know that God made Abraham extremely, extremely wealthy. What we forget is that Lot became very, very wealthy as well. Verse 7 says, And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. They, they both have a number of men under them. In fact, you can remember over in Genesis 14, Abraham has 300 men born in his own house who are soldiers who fight for him. These aren't, this isn't, I think so many times when we read through this, we think here's Lot, this little guy with this shepherd Cain and a few sheep around him and here's Abraham with his little Cain maybe a few more people and some sheep around him and some herds guys the kings in the area during that time looked at them and were scared of them they were such a massive crowd it was a massive group of people the Lord had blessed both of them Abraham and Lot tremendously they were they were kingdoms that were roaming across that land So Abraham said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate me. If to the left, then I will go to the right. If to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that all the valley of the Jordan, that it was all well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they were separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So Lot was a wealthy man. And up to this point, he's a shepherd, he's a rancher, and he's a tent dweller, a very successful one. But when the angels come to save him and his family in Genesis 19, you notice he's not living in a tent anymore, is he? He's in a house. And with his wealth, it was probably a very nice house. A, a nice house filled with nice things. So he's a wealthy man who is now married, living in a nice house rather than a tent. Not only that, he probably had a place of prominence among the people. Because you remember Uncle Abraham had saved their cities from defeat against four kings in Genesis 14 who were taxing the cities. And remember, they rebelled against them. War broke out, and Abraham came to save the day. So because of Lot's uncle, Sodom and Gomorrah were no longer under the rule of foreign kings, nor were they having to pay taxes to someone else. So because of Lot's uncle, Sodom and Gomorrah were free. So Mrs. Lot is a woman who is enjoying wealth. She is a woman who is enjoying prestige. She is enjoying property. She is living nicely. She has a nice house. She has nice things. She's probably very comfortable, very happy with her life. And so it's no surprise that she turns back to look at what she really longed for, what she really loved. What a message. Remember Lot's wife. If your life is all about what you have in this world, if that's what's life to you, if your joy comes from the house that you have, the car that you drive, the kids that you have, the job, the career, the prestige, the things of this world, if you value the possessions and positions in this world above Christ, if you love what this world has to offer if you love it above him if you obey the world and not him then you're going to lose your life 
as Lot's wife did. That's the principle here. On the day of his return, it's going to reveal where the heart really is because people will turn to that which they love the most on that day. In fact, Jesus gives us that very principle here in verse 33. Look at it, back in, back in Luke 17, verse 33. This is the issue that he's driving home here. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. That's a principle that applies not just to that day of his return, but to all men of, of, of all time. What do you love? In fact, back in Luke chapter 9, verse 24 and through 26, he says, for, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is, a, what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and with the holy angels. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, he says the same thing. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves father or more than mother more than me. That's the issue here. Those who love mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And then he says, he who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Same thing. In fact, we find the same thing again in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27. We find the same thing in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 through 38. He says, and he summoned the crowd with the disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel, in other words, Christ is the priority of your life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the priority of your life. He is the Lord of your life. He is the one ruling over your life. Not the things of the world, not the lust of your flesh, but Him. Even in John's gospel, in John chapter 12, verse 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. We find that principle in every gospel. Five times in the gospel records we find this statement that whoever wishes to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. If your life is all about you, if, if your life is all about serving yourself to get what you want in this life, if, if, if if life to you is all about what the world has to offer and getting your little piece of the pie to make you happy, if life to you is all about this world, the relationships here, the stuff here, if that's what life amounts to for you, then understand you will lose your life in judgment. The question here is simply, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Do you genuinely love God above all else? Do you love His righteous ways such that you strive to walk in them? Do you love His word? Are His commandments a delight to you? Do you love His people? Do you sacrificially care for one another, long to be with them? Are you longing to see Christ return as His bride? Are you keeping yourself pure and separated from sin? Do you hate sin? 
Do you strive to put it off and love his righteous ways? Do you love to tell others about him? Do you talk about him? Is he what fills your heart? Do you love to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Jesus says, this is eternal life, that you might know him, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life isn't about positions. Eternal life isn't about possessions. If it is, you're in a very dangerous place. Remember Lot's wife. If you haven't already given it all up, counting Christ as your greatest treasure, the pearl of great price, if he's not the joy and the passion of your life, the Lord of your life, the Savior of your life, then you're in a very dangerous place and need to repent and turn to him and ask him for mercy and forgiveness of sin that you might have him, that you might have the forgiveness of sin and eternal life in him. Remember Lot's wife. So where is your heart? Is it with him or is it against him? Because the heart of each will be revealed in judgment, just like Lot's Lot's wife was. Her heart was never with the God of Abraham. The last characteristic we're given here ties in with that. In the same way Lot and his wife were divided, at Jesus' second coming, people people will be suddenly and permanently divided. You don't come into the kingdom of God on someone else's coattails. In that day, in that judgment, there will be a division that takes place. It'll be sudden and it'll be permanent. Look at verse 34. He says, I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. Again, we're talking about that that day when he comes, his second coming. You say, well, it says night here. Is he coming day or is he coming night? Well, the world's a big place, and on half of it it'll be day, on the other half it'll be night. Then both, remember, back in verse 24, it's going to be lightning flashing when he comes. Everybody will know at that moment, whether they're in the dark in the night or in the day working. Either way, they're going to know that what just happened. They're going to know that he comes. It's worldwide. Everyone will know. So on that night, there will be two in one bed. Maybe it's a husband and wife. be two in bed one will be taken and the other one will be left there's the divide and the most intimate and the most and the closest of relationships one is left one is taken Verse 35, it says, there will be two women grinding at the same place. That's daytime here. Two working, one will be taken and the other will be left. Whether it's night or day, one's taken and one's left. It's it's a time of division. It's a time of separation. Who has come to Christ genuinely and loves the Lord and who hasn't come to him and has rejected him? Now, before we get a take a little closer look at that you'll note that if you're reading the NASB verse 36 is in brackets and if you're reading the ESV there's no verse 36 it's not there they didn't print it it skips from 35 to 37 and the reason for that is because in some of the earliest manuscripts that verse isn't included actually we find that exact verse in Matthew's parallel account where Matthew says two men will be in, in the field, one will be taken and the other will be left. And it's, it's possible when you do textual cr- criticism that the earliest manuscripts, if they don't have that, then that's the accurate reading. Somewhere along the line, a scribe added this from Matthew, maybe because he had it in memory and was just writing it down. He adds it here, and that's how it got into your Bibles, but that's why it's not in the ESV and why it's bracketed in the NASB there. Having said that, there's no theological implications for it being there or not being there. The the, the point of the text is still the same, that when the Son of Man suddenly returns, there will be a sudden division among people. 
as people are going about life, some sleeping, some working, he's going to come and suddenly people are going to be separated. They're going to be divided, one taken and the other left. Now, some people think this is talking about the rapture. Some people think this is talking about a taking away of believers. But from our context, I want you to see that this taking away isn't talking about the rapture at all. But from our context, first, look look at our median context. It's all about judgment when the Son of Man returns. It will be like the days of the destruction of the wicked in the days of Noah and Lot, verse 26 through 30. That's the context here. It's one of judgment. It's one of destruction. And the question is, where are those taken going to go? I mean, there's two people here in these illustrations. One is taken, the other is left. Now, now we know that the one that's left, one's going to still be in bed, and the other one's going to still be at a grinding stone. We, we know where they are. The question is, where are the other ones taken? Where are they? Well, the disciples had that exact same question. And so they ask it in verse 37. And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? Where? In other words, where are they taken? The question isn't where are those who are left, but where, Lord, where are those who are taken? Where do they end up? And Jesus gives us the answer to that in the last part of this verse. Look at it. And he said to them, where the body is, where the body that was taken is, there also the vultures will be gathered. The body that was taken will be in a place where it says the vultures will be gathered. That's not a picture of glory. It's not, a, it's not a picture of life. It's where judgment has fallen. In fact, in Matthew 24, in the parallel count, verse 27, we have the same phrase in, in, in the same context. And he says there, For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then he says in verse 28, Wherever the corpse is, There the vultures will gather. The focus is on the one taken in judgment. And that's the same picture that John gives us over in Revelation 19 when the angel tells him on the day of Christ's return, on the prelude to the kingdom, there will be judgment of the wicked. And it says in Revelation 19, 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble. He's talking to the birds here. Come, assemble yourself together for the great supper of God, so that you, the birds, may eat of the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. He says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. And those who worshipped his image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, and the rest, the rest, the ones that were taken away, The rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The taking away here is a sudden dividing among people, among even the closest relationships. One taken in judgment because they didn't trust the Lord for their forgiveness of sin and eternal life. One taken because they didn't want him to be their king. And the other left. You say, well, what about the one that was left? Well, those who are the people from the various nations who repented during the tribulation period 
who responded to the gospel preaching of the 144,000 Jews who were brought to faith during that time as well, of those Gentiles who are saved, many will be martyred for their faith, but some will enter into the millennial kingdom as the Gentile nations, along with the nation of Israel who comes to faith during that time, and the Lord Jesus Christ will be their king. Will be their king. That's the prelude to his kingdom. It will be a day in which believers will be longing for his kingdom. It will be a day that will be witnessed by the world. It will be a day that is delayed. It will be a day of sudden destruction of the wicked. It will be a day when hearts are revealed. And it will be a day where people are suddenly and permanently divided for all eternity. And knowing that, knowing that that is coming, understanding that aspect of future things, knowing that he is coming again, knowing that the prelude to his kingdom will be a time of judgment to extinguish the wicked from the earth, all who reject his lordship, who have rejected his sacrifice for sin, the question is how then should we live, right? How then should we live? In light of his coming, how then shall we live? Those who have received him now as the Lord and Savior, how then shall we live? Well, we have that in all of the epistles. It tells us over and over. But let me give you just two verses to, to meditate on, to think about. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says this, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us. This is what it, it, it does. It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. Don't be like Lot's wife. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's how we are to live in light of his future coming to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. One more verse. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. He says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope, this is for us, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So we're to be those who are living in this day looking forward to his coming. We are to live in light of his coming. We are to be denying ungodliness and worldly desires and living sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Purifying ourselves as he is pure. And if we wanted to add one more, sharing the truth of the gospel. So we're inviting all those who don't know him yet, inviting them to the kingdom to repent from their sin and to seek him with all their heart. Heavenly Father, this has uh, been such a wonderful time in your word. As our minds and our hearts have been thrust into eternity future, we see the practical nature of how, that, how we can live in light of that future here in our own lives. We pray that above all else, you will help us to do that. We want to 
be those who with that inner reality of you ruling and reigning in our hearts now, we want to be those who have received you. We want to be those who are telling others about the judgment to come and inviting them to Christ that they might be saved from his wrath. Help us to live in a way that would be different from the world so they see your power and your grace at work in us. And help us to be bold in our testimony to others and inviting them that they might enjoy you forever. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.